time is at hand, and this comes from Revelation 1, verse 3, um, which it's, it's wonderful this book starts out this way. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Um, brethren, this is the title of the second volume, and um, we're going to hopefully have a practical demonstration. It's been interesting. Uh, we've enjoyed the uh, discourses that we heard. Unfortunately, we missed Brother Rick's earlier uh, because of a conflict. Our class had a business meeting. We appreciate, Brother Rick, you keeping time so well. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, dear friends, before we continue, we should bring the love from the Muhammad Ecclesia, especially from Brother Danny and Sister Judy McClugan. One of the services that especially set the table, so to speak, for me, was Brother Allen's service on the first volume. You know, when we think about the lessons in the first volume, the ransom, two salvations, restitution, and the purpose of Christ's return, it raises the question naturally, when are these things coming? It's interesting, Brother Russell lays out the plan in the first volume without really getting into prophetic time. And that's the subject of the second volume, which we're going to share a few things about today. Now we'd like to start with Psalm 46, verse four and five. Uh, brethren, if you've not been meditating on Psalm 46 here recently, I might be a little surprised. The brethren have really been considering just what's happening in the earth today. And Psalm 46 is one of the most encouraging passages because it speaks of the Lord's help, his being a refuge to the church in a time when um, the mountains are being shaken and cast into the sea and the sea is roaring with the swelling thereof and so forth. It's a very apt description of the time since 1914. Well, in the middle of that discussion, we find this in Psalm 46, that there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it prefer her when the morning dawns. Uh, dear brethren, this city is a reference to um, the city of God. It's really a reference to the Lord's people. Psalm 46, of course, is talking about making the Lord your refuge in the time when things are falling apart in the earth. And here we have this promise, which is kind of unusual. How do streams make glad the city of God? Friends, we believe the scripture here is talking about the streams that come from the mountains from the snow melt far above, and that this is representative of the truths that began to come to the church during the time of our Lord's presence, that that was the dawning of the morning for the church. One translation refers to this as her morning, when her morning dawns. We love that thought of this being the church's morning. Well, Job 33, excuse me, 3822 asked the question, have you entered into the storehouses of the snow? And uh, King James has storehouses as treasure. And friends, you can see the fitness of this symbol, that snow is frozen water. In other words, it is truth that is held for a particular time when the water is actually needed. When the sun uh, rises and the snow melts and provides blessings to the Lord's people. Now we point this out, brethren, because we love this concept of truth just in time, that our Heavenly Father arranged it, that the church should come to understand so many details of truth at the time when the world again would be falling apart, when things that was stood for centuries are questioned and cast aside. And, and brethren, this is something we're kind of interested. We heard the conversation after Brother Rick's talk, just how much change can individuals take, whether they be in the world or among the brotherhood. And we say this because the Lord gives us the helps. We really need the understanding of what's happening in the earth. And we need great devotion, brethren, in our experiences 
And both of these comes from our Lord's word and the understanding that he has given to us. And Habakkuk 2 is very familiar to the brethren to write the vision down and make it plain upon tables. In giving this truth just in time, the Lord saw that mankind would need, excuse me, the church would need among mankind a roadmap, so to speak, that the church could carry forth its consecration to the end and also be a light shining in the world. Even though the plan can seem so improbable as we look at the trouble in the earth. But again, brethren, it's pretty remarkable that it's truth just in time that is given for the Lord's people. We just like to recap when you think about our harvest truth heritage. And brethren, this gives me goosebumps because I once was totally unaware of truths in the scriptures, although I studied the Bible. The most I got out of it was believe in Jesus. But here we find that harvest truth includes things that are very basic to us now, the ransom and restitution, Jesus' return, its purpose, and how all of Jesus' return has to harmonize within the plan so that the manner and the time are just right. Um, the purpose of the church, you know, the two salvations, friends, that was the hook that really got me to think that the church had a part in the salvation of mankind by God's grace and through Jesus' offices, permission of evil, the judgment day being a time of rescue for mankind, not a time of just of condemnation, times and seasons, Israel's place, the harvest, the fate of the nominal churches, and so forth. Friends, um, you know, if you know much about church history, there are questions that have plagued the churches for centuries. And here we find in the time of our Lord's return, in a 20-year period of time, we find that all of these subjects are addressed in a systematic manner in the studies in the scriptures. You know, friends, I had a challenge when I was first studying. I'd been taught as a Baptist that the definition of a cult was following a man. And yet here I am studying and finding out these beautiful truths about the two salvations and the ransom. Oh, friends, I remember thinking at one point, you know, am I following a man? Is this right? These truths are so wonderful. And then the Lord brought to my attention that what do the ministers study? They go to seminaries and they study books on theology that other men have written. And dear friends, that really helped me to realize that um, the issue really is, can you prove things by the scriptures? And that is something, dear friends, I found in Brother Russell's writings. The respect for the scriptures are so tremendous and it's so helpful what we've been given. Now, I'd like to underscore, someone mentioned, I think, in fellowship yesterday, that the volumes are like textbooks, and I think of them like those seminary textbooks, except they lead us to the truth. And again, it's remarkable, all these truths that have been given to us just in time, the time uh, that is needed. Uh, brethren, we've had some discussion. It's interesting to me, the brethren sometimes have discussions about um, the place of truth and prophetic truth in particular and our characters. Well, the scriptures present the church at this time as being watchers and that the Lord would gird himself and make them sit down to, to meet and he would serve them, brethren. We should really expect to have an understanding of truth if we reach out and grasp for that understanding. When we're the Lord's and Spirit begotten, he promises to do this, to lay out the truth for us in due time. Uh, brethren, we just want to mention here, because I thought the questions have been very interesting. Um, we have to keep in mind, the adversary would like us to pit the understanding of truth, knowing our Father's will, uh, versus our characters. And brethren, the scriptures present it that both are essential. We must, in the end, have the character of Christ to be faithful, but it is through the understanding of the truths, these just-in-time truths, that are necessary for us to make our calling election sure. 
Well, in the second volume, the question again is, when will these blessings come? And the thought is, when is Christ returning? Because he is the great bringer of the blessings for mankind. So how did that understanding of the time of Jesus' presence unfold? There are really four um, avenues of testimony that the second volume addresses. One is chronology. Another is the times of the Gentiles. The Jubilees is a third and the parallels. Now, what we'd like to do, dear friends, because the second volume has been quite controversial, is look at the scriptural underpinnings for these teachings. Um, we don't have time to go into each one of these doctrines in detail, but we do want to take a look at what is it behind each of these truths that makes it so important to our understanding. Now, there have been recent challenges to uh, the second volume. You know, brethren, the time has been long, and so it's not surprising that we might wonder, well, are these, you know, uh, teachings dated? And brethren, again, for us, the issue isn't what we may think about these, but what do the scriptures say? What is the scriptural underpinning for each of these uh, subjects? And friends, we would just note, these are such important testimonies about our Lord's presence um, that when there are discussions about, you know, the Lord's presence and the times and seasons, um, those that would differ, and we say this with respect, dear brethren, we appreciate the comments about how we need to listen, and we think a lot of the passage in Ephesians 4.15 about speaking the truth in love. Our Father chooses our brethren. He also gives us truth. How committed are we to understanding and sharing the truth, realizing that our understanding can be imperfect and we are still learning ourselves on this side? Friends, frankly, I find the greatest character development for me has come through striving to apply, speaking the truth in love to our brethren, helping them and receiving help you know, friends, I knew nothing about the truth, and I look back and I think about how some of the brethren put up with my ignorant questions at the beginning, heard me out, shared scriptures, and encouraged me to prove things for myself. We don't know in our conversations what our words may help, and we always want to give our Lord the honor and let him direct our words uh, one with each other. Well, one of the issues, brethren, in discussing chronology is the relation of the chronology and the Sabbath day. Uh, Brother Russell found it to be, uh, again, just in time uh, truth to realize that 6,000 years ended, 6,000 years from Adam's creation ended in 1872. And at that time, the Allegheny class where Brother Russell was studying was coming to an understanding of the ransom and restitution. Friends, I find this remarkable that the group that Brother Russell was studying with, they came to an understanding really of the heart of the message. And so as he looked at the chronology that others you know, shared with him, and he looked at the uh, truths that he had learned, he realized it was not by chance that understanding the purpose of the millennium, when the restitution processes would be, that um, that was just in time to realize the 6,000 years had ended, and this would be the 7,000 year or the 7,000 day. Now, he makes this point that there's no direct statement in the scriptures that the 7,000 year would be the epic of Christ's reign. But he mentions there's a reasonable foundation. Dear friends, we mention this because we have direct statements of Scripture that we should believe. We should take Jesus' words when they're plain and direct and accept those. There are other things, brethren, that our faith grasps. And we see in the Scriptures that there are all of these patterns of seven over and over again. The creative days, years in the Jubilee cycle, days in the week. We see that Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Um, he, was refer he referred to himself as the Lord of the Sabbath. 
And he was really illustrating the work of the millennium, dear friends. Well, for my faith, those examples are conclusive that the last thousand years is the seventh day. And this does become important in our discussions going forward. Well, dear friends, there are disagreements over chronology, and um, we believe the scriptural view that 6,000 years ended in 1874, and I should have put here 6,000 years of sin. We believe Adam had two years in the garden um, before he fell, and that the 6,000 years begins with the entry of sin at that point. Um, there is another view that 6,000 years end in 2043. Now, for myself, dear brethren, I find, you know, when there's a discussion, um, it's important in the difference. It's important to lay out the understanding that underpins each of the questions. So as you look, brethren, at these two points, um, for example, the book of the judges, or period, the period of the judges, uh, Paul tells us is 450 years. There's some discussion about the meaning of that scripture and just exactly what it says. Um, I do believe that it is 450 years. Um, the New View puts forward that the judges period is 349 years or 101 years difference. And you find another difference in the kings and also with how long is the desolation. Now with the kings, dear brethren, we'll just mention here if you compare the book of Chronicles and the books of the Kings, you will find that the Kings of Judah, if you go through and you look up every King in the period of his reign, you will find that they match exactly from beginning to end. This is what we mean by two witnesses agree. There's two different writers, one for Chronicles and one for Kings. Of course, our Lord overall, oversaw this, the challenge gets into the kings of Israel. Kings of Israel are not, their reigns are not recorded in the book of Chronicles. You find them only in the book of Kings. And brethren, for us, this is quite important because the kings of Judah, when you follow their line, it brings you down to um, the beginning of the desolation of Israel. And brethren, that is something that is prophesied about. And we wanted to make this point very strongly that when you look at the Bible itself, the Bible has these various threads of chronology. And the scriptures give ways that those can be linked together. But there is a point where those chronological threads come to an end. In other words, the kings of Judah's line and all of these statements about how long the king ruled and when his son's reign picked up, that ends with the desolation of the land. Now, brethren, that is exactly where prophecy picks up. And we mention this, brethren, because it is only the scriptures that provide us a a look from beginning from Adam all the way down to uh, the end of the kingdom when mankind has been restored. And we just really want to let that point seek in. There is no other testimony that in one place gives an entire history and future of man according to God's plan. Um, if you take a look at the kings um, in the New View, harmonizing Israel and Judah kings, um, the issue there is the new view takes the position that we must harmonize um, these accounts and goes into looking quite a bit at um, what is going on in other countries. You know, today we have a lot of clay tablets from ancient civilizations that have been revealed that also have chronologies in them. Some of those have mentions of what's happening in Israel and Judah. And so the New View takes those uh, chronological tablets and looks at the testimony they give in order to harmonize with the chronology that the scriptures give. And what you find with the desolation, brethren, is the archaeological record, uh, what many say is that the desolation was only 49 years 
although the scriptures, Daniel 9 to Daniel's an observer. It's kind of amazing to me, rather than that this is a, a controversy, because Daniel mentions the 70 years being fulfilled, and he mentions that according to the books of Jeremiah, well, it's very plain in comparing those scriptures that he is talking about the desolation of the land, that it is 70 years. And brother, we have to keep in mind that with the world, there's quite a bit of attempt to overthrow the Bible these days. It's not just the morality of the scriptures, but the Western world in particular, the secular world, has a real problem with the authority of the scriptures. And so we find there's a very strong theme in biblical archaeology that is opposed to any harmonization that would confirm the scriptural testimony as it's given. Um, we mentioned this earlier, only the Bible contains that connected chronology. And we don't find again in any writing any place else, um, you know, one document that provides this from beginning to end. To me, that's a real testimony that our Heavenly Father has provided the answer for us. Um, the scriptural follow, chronology follows the line of the promised seed. You'll recall it's not only Abraham's seed, but it also is the Davidic line that um, the promised Messiah would come through. And so we find that the kings of Judah are children of David, and they, they bring us down to Cyrus' proclamation that the Jews would return to Jerusalem. Up to the desolation first, but then there's 70 years that, that then is ended with Cyrus' proclamation. And friend, Cyrus pictures Jesus, and, and this is to me amazing. We would really encourage the dear friends, as you study, again, to look for the scriptural underpinnings in the context, the imagery that's given, the symbolism. Um, the chronology leads us again to Cyrus with that prophetic 70 years, which is a picture then of Jesus overthrowing Babylon and restoring Israel at the end of the age, restoring really um, the church and mankind too. So brethren, we, we share this because if you compare the kings of Israel again, they simply end with the destruction of the nation and that um, line of kings, and if you read the history of these Israelite kings um, after the ten tribes broke away, it is a terrible story of murder and intrigue, individuals taking over the throne and so forth. And you might ask, why would you know God follow that chronology um, that really leads to, we'll call it a dry hole. It doesn't connect to any other prophecies in the scriptures, but um, again, the archaeologists have tried to put a date on that, and that has been a, become a challenge to um, the chronology that the scriptures give. Now, what was Brother Russell's response to the knowledge that Jesus had returned in 1874? Friends, I, you may know the story how he met with uh, Nelson Barber. And he, again, had the understanding of ransom and restitution. And so they knew how the Lord, uh, what he would do in his return, the purpose of it, in other words. Nelson Barber really brought out uh, the word parousia, meaning presence, invisible presence. And he pointed to the prophecies that pointed to 1874. Now, when Brother Russell came to understand that, uh, he recognized immediately that that meant if Christ were present, he returns as reaper, and so therefore it must be the time of harvest, and he saw that the harvest work had to be done. Now, this is important, brethren, because it ties to another uh, prophecy, but you can see the importance of when we understand truth, we also have responsibility to it in what we do cooperating with the times and seasons or the lesson that the Lord gives to us. Now, there's a clue we believe in Luke 12. Now, this is a companion text to Matthew 24, uh, 45 to 47. Uh, brethren, it's really interesting when you look at Matthew 24, the apostles say or ask, 
what will be the sign of thy parousia? And Jesus gives them a long history of the gospel age, and then he tells them several things that would happen uh, during the time of his parousia. One of these is the servants would be watching. He would serve them meat, as I mentioned earlier. Now, Luke clarifies, because there's often a question about, is the servant that is mentioned in Matthew 24, 45 to 47, the, ma the servant that is given um, authority over the meat in due season to share with the household, Luke brings out, Peter asked, are you talking about one or is this a class? Are you telling all of us or is it just one? And Jesus responds in the singular. He tells us first that all of the watchers, plural, um, they need to be watching in order to have the understanding of truth. And then he goes on to point out there would be one who would be a faithful and wise steward and that would give meat in due season. Now, we emphasize this, brethren, not that you don't know these things, but the next portion here, blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. Now, think about that, friends, that when the Lord returned, one of the issues is who would be the one to serve the meat to the household. And brethren, as you look at the words in Matthew 24, it really speaks to at the time of Jesus' arrival, he would appoint the steward. That time of arrival, when we look at the word when the master comes, it's not parousia, it's not during the long period of the presence, but it really does mean the moment of arrival, that he was looking to see who had the spirit of doing what is that doing? The doing is the desire to feed the household. And this is what Brother Russell's attitude was when he heard that the Lord was present, it must be the harvest. And so right away he saw, how are we going to tell everyone? And he funded first um, Barber's publication to try to get the word out to all. Uh, Barber was rather a wet blanket, uh, we might say, about this. He told Brother Russell, well, I have a few on my list, but they're kind of tired and sleepy and so forth. But Brother Russell immediately saw, we've got to let everyone know it's the time of harvest. And then from there, the work progressed. And friends, personally, I think what a wonderful confirmation it was to Brother Russell when he saw the hundreds and thousands that came out of the systems and formed ecclesias. Now we mentioned Matthew 24, 45 to 47 already, and also the point about the word erkomai. Um, it does reference the time of arrival. So dear friends, the times of the Gentiles, we'll go to our second point. The first one really, brethren, is just if you look at the areas of disagreement with the chronology, brethren, and you look at the scriptural underpinnings, I believe there's very good reason to take the chronology that Brother Russell gave to us. And there's confirmations in some of these other uh, points that, that we'll share. Now, the times of the Gentiles, Jesus mentions this in Luke 21, 24, and he focuses on the times of the Gentiles being a period when Jerusalem would be trodden down, when the interests of the nation of Israel would be oppressed by the Gentiles. And this is really a fulfillment in Leviticus 26 of a warning that if Israel did not hearken to the Lord, that he would punish Israel seven times for their sins. Now, you find in the scriptures that a time is um, in symbol a year, and so seven times being punished, that would be 2,520 uh, prophetic years. Um, and I should say in here you have 360 days for a year. So if you take the time of the year and you then translate that to uh, prophetic years, and I'm sorry I'm not explaining this the best, but seven times 360 comes out to the 2,520 prophetic years. And dear brethren, it's rather remarkable when you study, if you look at Jewish history, um, they will point out that the first temple is destroyed on the ninth of Av, and the second temple is destroyed on exactly the same day. 
Um, we believe that that period of time is 2,520 years difference from the time when Israel lost its kingdom until the time when World War I began, which really began the weakening of the nations and led to the establishment of Israel as the Jewish homeland. Again, reestablishment. Um, Ezekiel 21, 25 to 27 mentions, uh, the prophet tells us about how uh, the king had been so unfaithful that he would have to remove the crown, remove the diadem, and that he would be abased and the Gentiles would be exalted and that the dominion would be overturned, overturned, overturned until he comes whose right it is. And God would give the dominion to him. Now, friends, here we find that Ezekiel in, in the prophecy is talking about the Babylonians coming to destroy Jerusalem. And um, again, Jesus emphasizes it's the treading down of Jerusalem. And here we can say the destruction of Jerusalem. It's not Jewish captivity is directly linked to the Gentile times. Now, Brian, this is important. We mentioned the period of desolation, the 70 years. If you start the times of the Gentiles before the desolation of, of the land, um, well, you miss the context that Ezekiel, his prophecy is talking about the destruction of the nation, uh, the removal of the king. It's not just being taken into captivity. Um, if you break down Ezekiel 21, 25 to 27, you find that um, the kingdom is turned over first to Babylon, overturned then to the next universal empire, then to the third, Greece, and finally to Rome. And it's during the time of the Roman beast or the uh, legs of the image and feet that that is the time of Jesus' return. And so we just point out here, brethren, again, we think it's important to compare, and this is where we're looking at scriptural underpinnings, that um, the times of the Gentile begin with destruction of Jerusalem and Zedekiah losing his throne. Um, oh, I've got the wrong number in here. World War I ends on the 9th of Ab. Got a typo. Sorry about that. And that it is exact to the day. Now, the new chronology ties the times of the Gentiles to the seven-year rise of Babylon between 610 and 603, and the desolation doesn't occur until 587. If you take the new view in the 2,520 years, then the Gentile times end during a period from 1911 to 1918. Now, the first issue, brethren, for me is that the Gentile times are on Jerusalem on the Jewish people. It's not about the slow rise of a foreign power as the new view begins. And brethren, we'd also point out it is important when we study that every point is established in the scriptures. Uh, 1911 is a, a time in history of conflict in the Balkans, but you have to ask yourself, okay, is there any scripture that points to that particular time? Is that a significant event according to the scriptures? In human history, it certainly is, dear brethren, but is it scripturally important? And brethren, we've not found anything, you know, for that. Um, 1918, we believe, is similar. Some find that as a parallel event. Um, but for ourselves, brethren, scripturally, we don't find anything specific that is talking about the end of World War I. Uh, so for us, brethren, each period has to be established by the scriptures. It can't just be a pattern. Um, these things, to me, become patterns without meaning. Um, unless they're scripturally authorized. And you'll see this more as we go. Um, the Jubilees are referenced in Leviticus 25, verse 8. This is our third point in 10. Um, and, and brethren, this is something I absolutely knew nothing about when I was a Baptist. And to discover a scripture like Acts 3, 19 to 21, speaking of the times of restitution and the link to Christ's return, um, and the fact that all the prophets spoke of it, 
You know, friends, I never heard of the times of restitution before coming to the brotherhood. And what are these times of restitution? How are they pointed to in the scriptures? Well, it really is a reference to the Jubilees. You know, today, brethren will, or excuse me, the world will talk about Jubilees in the sense of how long this queen reigned and, and so forth. But the Jubilee was something that was common in the nation of Israel, or meant to be common, that um, every family would have their land restored on the 50th year. You know, if they had come to a point where they had to sell their land, or they had to go into voluntary bondage to pay their debts, each family had a chance to return to their land under the Jubilee system. Of course, the Jubilees included the seven Every seventh year was a year of rest on the land, uh, but it's just a wonderful picture of restitution, how liberty would be proclaimed and every man would be returned to his possession and to his family. Again, what a wonderful picture that that is. And the scriptural view, and again, I'm not going into the, the specific proof, but the Jubilees point 1874 is the beginning of Jesus' parousia, and also the times of restitution. Um, that 2,500 years comes down to 1874 from the last opportunity to act that Israel had to keep the Jubilee. And um, notice in um, Acts 3, 19 to 21, uh, it speaks of the restitution of all things. And brethren, we believe it has a slow start, you might say. We might think of restitution in terms of the individual restoration of each and each person. But what we find in the scriptures is the great restorer, Jesus, returns, and it has a great impact in the earth. You know, giving the truth to the brethren and the brethren being a light in the world. You know, I think, dear friends, here you have kings on the throne. Um, in, in Europe, and they controlled 80% of the world at that time. And here the truth is coming out that every man will be a king in the kingdom, and they will each have their own vine and their own fig tree, so to speak. Each will have their place and part in the bounties of earth. Um, that begins with our Lord's return, the restoration of truth, uh, the beginning of work with the nation of Israel, and the general lifting of mankind's condition. Do you ever think, why is life so different today? Why are there all these changes coming about? Um, it's really from our master's uh, return as a restorer. Now, the new view points to 1878 as the beginning of restitution. And in 1878, the Jewish people could buy land in Israel. In this view, the Jubilee focuses on Israel's restoration as opposed to the larger restoration of all things. So here again, we believe it's important to recognize Peter links the times of restitution to Jesus' return, uh, not with Israel's restoration only. That's a part of it, but restitution is actually much larger. Uh, brethren, one thing we mentioned, I'm sorry, we should have said with the Gentile times, is the scripture Acts 2.44 that says, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven would set up a kingdom that would break in pieces this image, basically. Um, and friends, for myself, one of the craziest things I ever heard the brethren say when I was learning the truth is that Jesus was invisibly present. And the way my understanding opened up was through this Daniel 2.44, because it points that it was in the days of the kings, uh, those kings that um, controlled the earth at 80%, I mentioned, they controlled 80% of the earth at that time, represented in the ten toes of the image that was in their day that the Lord would return and the crushing work of that image would begin. And of course, we don't have many kings left today, and they are more on the ceremonial side, as we've just seen with uh, Queen Elizabeth. So just another important piece here, brethren, in, in that um, Jesus' return is tied in with the destruction of kings who are already gone, 
uh, in other words. And with regard to the parallels, this is our fourth point. And to sum it up, because the parallels can be very hard to understand, but really the parallels are a time type. In other words, the Jewish age is a typical of the gospel age. Friends, I like to think of it as the Jewish age is a pantomime where they were doing things that meant something much grander to happen in the gospel age. And you can take the ceremonies from the Jewish age and see that they picture the course of Jesus and the church and the gospel age. The tabernacle, for example, it really shows the work of what the Christ would be doing during the gospel age. Parallels are also based on a concept of the Jewish double, which is called a Mishnah, 1845-year period of favor, followed by 1845 years of disfavor. And also, there is a direct chronological link, and, and I think this part is really missed sometimes, that God gave Paul to tell us that the time of Israel's disfavor would be a period of favor to the Gentiles with regard to the gospel call. And we find that in Romans 11, where the blindness of Israel uh, continues until the fullness of the Gentiles come into the body of Christ. So a little bit more about that. Here are some of the ceremonies under the law that picture um, things in the in the gospel age. The night of the Passover um, pictures the gospel age, for example. And brethren, we love a phrase, if, I hope you get this, but the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, where the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. It's pretty amazing the way the Lord had Israel, again, pantomime the experiences that the church would have later. Now, here's the Jewish devil, this Mishnah, and dear friends, uh, for time, I can't say a lot about this, but... If you take a look at the handout I had posted in um, the chat, uh, you can take a look at these things. And we hope, dear brethren, that uh, this does encourage you to take a look at these, these truths. But there is a double portion, first of favor, then of disfavor. And it is a period of 1,845 years. Interestingly, the new view and the scriptural view both agree that it is a period of 1845 years. The New View uses the 1845, although it comes from uh, different experiences, as we'll see. Um, so moving ahead, brethren, when you, if you have a chance to look and study this, there are three scriptures that give us uh, support for each part of the double, and we have them here. We'll, we'll go on ahead after that. Now, it's quite interesting. Romans 11.25 is the verse that mentions the blindness uh, to Israel, in part, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. They're blind to the gospel call. Now, if you compare the double, um, the period of favor and the period of disfavor, the gospel call on Israel's blindness is actually longer. But it's quite interesting that Paul does this linkage between the Gentile experience and Israel's experience. I think that's very important, again, that the scriptures make a linkage, uh, and this is part of the basis on which the parallels rest. Um, Israel's period of favor is followed by a period of disfavor, which if you're into parallel lines, brethren, you realize that to make something opposite to a parallel, it looks like this, the line in the middle going up. And the favor to the church really is a match to Israel's period of favor. So it begins with Jacob's death. It ends with uh, Christ's death. Um, the favor to the church begins with Christ's death, quite interestingly. Um, and it continues um, until the time when the church is fully complete, at least the blindness portion. But there are parallels between 1878 and 1881 uh, when we take a look at AD um, 29, 33, and 36. Again, not to go into the detail here. 
So in the scriptural view, the parallels begin with Jacob's death, and that is a parallel to Jesus' death in AD 33. This is how you get the 1845 years. We find that Jacob's 12 sons picture the 12 apostles as the foundation for the church. One is the foundation for natural Israel. In the Anatype, the apostles are the foundation for the church. So Jacob's death marks the beginning of the Jewish age, then Jesus' death marks the beginning of the gospel age. Now, if you take the 845 years from Jesus' death and you go backwards, and this is what the New View does, the parallels begin instead of with Jacob's death, with Sarah's death. Now, Sarah's death in this view then parallels Jesus' death. Now, here, brethren, is where scriptural authority is really, really critical because Sarah's death represents the end of the grace covenant, the one under which the Christ is developed, whereas Jesus' death represents the opening of that covenant to the church. And here again, brethren, we see this for ourselves. This can't be scriptural because there should be authorization for the 1845 years that, that shows the correspondency the parallel, if you will, between the two deaths. Jacob's death in, in 1813 really fits, and what follows after fits so beautifully with the parallels. And again, both um, views use the 845 years, but very different beginning points. Uh, brother, we had a few scriptures in here. We'll have to hustle for time. But we want to remember that wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And we think there's a special test among the brotherhood in this day that we live since the Lord's return. You know, the increase of knowledge is quite a temptation to study and look into so many different aspects of what the world says is happening. We appreciate what Brother Rick said about being careful about what is new. I'm all for the understanding of history and science as they confirm what the scriptures say. Where they contradict, uh, we have to stick with the scripture. We are Bible students, and the Lord will reveal in time. Uh, right now, the understanding of history and science are both imperfect. You'll find the scientists can't agree on many things, and there's really varied uh, understandings of history among the biblical archaeologists as well as everyone else. Um, Paul tells us to be careful about science falsely so-called. He also warns about endless genealogy and avoiding foolish questions. For myself, those clay tablets that record the chronologies of heathen kings, uh, to me, those are endless genealogies and really are not helpful in our own study, dear brethren. You know, one of the things, if you take the point that we're to prove the truth, one part that is very difficult here is would we all be biblical archaeologists? Would the Lord's people be that in order to see whether the testimony of the archaeologists are correct? And will the archaeologists confirm someday if you keep going back in the uh, record that they're looking at um, archaeologically? Um, will that eventually show Adam? Um, do they have any faith in those that preceded Abraham? There's controversy over all the characters in the scriptures with biblical archaeologists saying, oh, this person never lived, or there's no evidence of that person. Uh, it's really an important point, brethren. The Lord said he would reveal his truth to babes and that he would make wise the simple. And so for us, brethren, the truth should be something that we can prove that will establish the faith even of the weak uh, among the brethren. Um, we'll go ahead here just real quickly, brethren. You know about proving all things. Paul also tells us to compare spiritual things with spiritual. For myself, the approach of the new view to compare um, these um, clay tablets and so forth with um, the scriptures is not comparing spiritual things with spiritual. It's taking earthly things and then bending the scriptural record to harmonize with those earthly things. 
Uh, it's very, very critical that we use the Lord's methods in how we study. Uh, keep in mind that the prophets and angels wanted to understand the things revealed to us today. It's really something, friends, how holy the truth is that we're given. And the adversary tries to take that away from us by having differences about these things. Um, the scriptures are full of promises that God will reveal his truth to us. Um, pass on from that. And just to summarize, we want to keep in mind the scripture cannot be broken. And we can't do anything against the truth, but for the truth. And friends, the fact that um, we are in ecclesias today, to me, is a real testimony that the times that Brother Russell understood were right. I believe they are scriptural above that. But it's rather remarkable. We sometimes can forget our own history. How did we come out of the churches? How is it there are all these ecclesias? The harvest work has proceeded, and it was based in the inspiration of the times and seasons. The brethren saw that there was a work to be done, that the chief reaper was present, and they proceeded in that. So for myself, brethren, I find the second uh, volume testimony very valid, holding to today, and that the things in the church's history and in the large history of the world, like 1914, the eviction of the Gentiles beginning, are great confirmations of what we've been given in the second volume. May the Lord add his blessing, and we'll invite you to sing hymn 233 now.